I mean, it's a list. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I like Peter I mean, Tosh and Buju myself, you know, <laughs> but you know. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Inner Sleeve on the Watch Mojo Podcast Network, the podcast taking a deep dive inside look behind the scenes at all things music. We're joined today by a very special guest all the way out in Montreal, Quebec, Jonathan Emil. How you doing, my man? I'm great. How you doing, Cassius? Good? I'm doing very good, and I appreciate you joining me on the show today. Um, a lot going on, a lot to talk about. You know, I just really wanted to go back with you to the beginning because music has been mm -hmm. a part of your life for such a long time. Um, yeah. When did this this whole journey really begin for you? Can you can you really think of a starting point in your head? I mean, definitely. Um, I think the true starting point was um, when I was um, battling cancer, actually. Um, when I was uh, 18, um, I was diagnosed with uh, life-threatening cancer. Um, called rhabdomyosarcoma and essentially you know that brought me back to a position of infancy and it made me completely dependent on my family and you know my, my, my whole circle so during that time um, you know I had to reduce all my school course loads I, I think I managed to keep one course just to, to keep in the rhythm of things um, and I had to be isolated so the type of uh, lockdown that we're experiencing now, I experienced then. You had to do that way back when you were 18. Yeah, yeah, because I had a compromised uh, uh, immune system. Right. Right, so um, the mask and the lockdown is very reminiscent, very reminiscent. But That it must be weird. That, it, it is weird, but in a certain sense, I'm kind of used to it. You know what I mean? Mm. Like the whole mask wearing and being very conscientious of washing hands and, and all the procedures that right. have to go with it. But it was during that time that... Um, I fell in love with music. I mean, I always loved music, but it was that time that, that I realized that it would be a healing force and a saving grace in my life. So um, when I was diagnosed, I had to go through, you know, surgery, multiple surgeries, uh, chemotherapy for over a year, um, you know, rounds and rounds of radiotherapy. So the whole wow. thing lasted over two years. And, and really um, the way that I dealt with it emotionally, spiritually, um, connecting with my family and friends and sort of leaving like a will and testament because I wasn't sure if I was going to make it. Wow. Was, um, I, I, I fell in love with music. I, I, I wrote uh, music and I decided that uh, if I make it through, I will continue down this path and, and continue to share um, uh, to share what I learned and to, to share positivity um, hmm. afterwards. Wow. So a lot to unpack there. So just to start, can you tell me again what type of cancer it was? Yeah, it's called rhabdomyosarcoma. And, okay. Um, it's a it's a pediatric cancer, and it usually appears in the soft tissues. And um, it, it appeared uh, just below the belt for me, and it you know was spread up all the way all all the way up to my lungs almost. So I was mm. lucky that it didn't get into my lungs, but I had to have you know rep, you know multiple surgeries, um, lymph node dissection, all that stuff to, to 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 stop it from spreading. But you know I'm really am one of the lucky ones, one of the ten percent that uh survive uh that type of, of cancer yeah wow that that's absolutely and by the way congratulations i mean we're so glad that you're here and you beat Thank it you. and you're a living inspiration to many for that um so what types of music really were you gravitating towards because my mind goes to two places either listening to something to just forget about everything and let go or listening to something sort of more serious and intense which one was it for you um you know to answer your question uh, in a funny way, both. Um, okay. Because you, you, I mean, you must know that um, you know, uh, you know, especially as as African American Black people, we have like a really strong musical tradition in like the spiritual sense, um, mm -hmm. and also in jazz music. Um, but the expressive part of it was really found in hip hop and, and reggae music. Mm -hmm. um, so with my upbringing and then um, the crisis that I was in, I found it really. Um, really rewarding to just write lyrics, you know. Yeah. Um, um, write uh, write songs, bridges, and, and connect the, the melodies with, with 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 the lyrics to to sort of give you a, a whole body experience. I mean, back there on your wall, you got John Lennon there. He's he's a mm -hmm. big inspiration too. And just the songwriting process, I just let it go where it needed to be. Sometimes it was just completely liberating, and then sometimes mm -hmm. it was really just, you know therapeutic and thoughtful and intellectual yeah 
And I guess it can never just be one thing, you know, when, when you're going yeah. through so many different, because obviously you're not just experiencing one emotion through that whole time, right? Exactly. You know, you're just dealing with all types of emotions, whatever outlet was there for me, you know, mm -hmm. um, I took it. Um, and, um, I, I, you know, it, uh, helped me through and it helps me to this day, you know, it's helped me throughout my career. So at that point, you're 18. Had you released music before or done any shows? Or was this the point where you were leading up to a yeah. release? I mean, nothing beyond like, um, you know, talent shows or, okay. uh, or uh, you know, church, church choir. You know, that, that was or the only real, you know, it was it was it was a hobby before then. Mm -hmm. um, was it your so own music or was it other people's music at those shows? I would usually do my own music. I would just, okay. you know. I don't know, all of us in, in elementary school and high school, we write mm -hmm. little raps and stuff like that, but it was a <laughs> hobby. It was a hobby, you know, but mm -hmm. during that period, I said, you know, if I make it through this, I want I want to make a career out of it. So, mm -hmm. so at the age of, you know, 22 around, I started to take it a little bit more seriously. And that, you know, for, for a lot of people in the music industry, that's a very late start. But right. that's when I sort of, you know, really sort of tried to start putting in my thousand hours to become an expert mm. or to, 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 to get where I needed to be and to get to a level of sophistication where I could really share everything with the world. Right. Did you find it easier to create in any sense when you didn't have that 10% survival rate looming over your head? Because that's a serious, serious percentage. And I hate to keep bringing it back to that, but yeah. I mean, it's incredible odds to have beaten. Um, do I find it easier? That's a great question. I never, I never really thought about it like that. Um, mm. music, um, for me has always been a way to escape and to organize, you know, um, like we were talking about before, um, it, I don't know if it's easier I'm, I, or if it was more difficult, it was really, was an escape. It was really right. allowing me to put things in perspective, you know, um, I think it might be easier right now just simply because. I've developed my craft in a way where I, I know what works and what doesn't work. And, and I've right. collaborated with some such interesting people that um, I've gained all this knowledge along, along the road. But um, yeah, I, I, I use music to escape that pressure, you know, that existential pressure, or exterior pressure. So right. uh, for me, it's like, it's liberating to work, to, to write music. So you're 22 years old at that point what were the first moves you made to make a serious run and start putting those thousand hours in? Um, I just tried to do shows. Mm -hmm. Just <laughs> kept doing do shows. shows. I just kept doing shows. Um, I kept writing. I tried to expand um, what I was able to do because I only really got into singing, you know, mm -hmm. when I was like 25 or whatever. Hmm. Um, so I was producing, I was writing, I was just really honing, honing the craft like focusing on the art even before the industry. Right. Um, and then, you know, I think I only put out my first album, like when I was like, I think it was 26. Yeah. The Love of nice. Fighter document was like the first real, real project I did. Um, and uh, that one, it was an album that had um, Buckshot, Murs, uh, Kendrick Lamar, uh, and a bunch of other local uh, Montreal talent on it. So that was like the first album and it took me like a good four years to write, produce and, and, and put that all together. Yeah, so a lot must have gone into that record also. So how much of the music from years before actually made it onto your first record? Uh, I, would, I would say a good like, I would say a good 70% of it. Okay. You know? And um, since I didn't know how to produce, I took my time producing, you know, mm -hmm. I really went overboard bringing in cellos and flutes and like, <laughs> ray, 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 all the whole orchestra. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Right. You know, because um, I just had this this vision of, of doing things right and being true to who I was as a person and, mm -hmm. and a collaborative vision. So I just brought all these elements together and it took it took, it took a while, it took a while to get that out. Yeah. So how, how did the collabs come about for the first project? Because there's some very big names yeah. for a first uh record it's phone calls man literally just connecting phone calls. Email, emails and phone calls um hmm. cold calls i say this is who i am this is the song this is who i'm about do you want to work let's work hmm. um and not all the collabs came through some of my favorite artists that you know it was the wrong timing uh they couldn't jump on the track but some of them did you know like i got to work with karis one you know um right and that song didn't even end up making the album in the end, but it came out on another project. But 
it, it was, you know, there was no industry magic at that point. It was literally me and my dude um, who used to manage me going hard, picking up the phone, writing emails and, and just trying to reach people and connecting with people online. That was it. It was at, you know, right when YouTube had the sweet spot, you know, when it was fast and accessible, but before the ads came in. <laughs> right. Well, what year uh, that, are you talking? Oh God, that was, uh, that must've been like 2009. 2009. Okay. Yeah. Definitely a sweet spot for YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. 2009 to 2012 was just like, hmm. it was like the wild west for YouTube before everything got monetized or whatever. Right. And that was, that was the time where I was finding my footing. So people, I would assume, were fairly responsive when it comes to features, because I mean, I've reached out to a lot of different labels and such for interviews, but they usually don't mm -hmm. jump as quick to answer because they're mostly, you know, they're not getting paid. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, I think a lot of it has to do with the, 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 the integrity of the music, because at the end of the day, mm -hmm. it just comes to the artist. And if they have the, the type of freedom and control over the career um, and they're feeling your, your music, I mean... Then, then, then it's uh, there's a good possibility that will happen. You know? It's a no lose situation for them because they're getting paid, yeah. and then they're also involved in something that they enjoy. Exactly. That that's it for them. You know. Um, yeah. But but you know it gets complicated. But that aside, I think I think that you know if the artist is feeling the track and if they they want to do it, um, where there's a will, there's a way. And um, um, I was fortunate enough to deal with um, a lot of artists who I find artists who I respected you know, mm -hmm. and who could vibe with on the same uh, creative level. And um, so it's easy. It's like, you know, it's like, oh, why haven't we worked together before type of thing? So yeah, knock right. on doors, make phone calls. That's it. And I mean, for, for yourself as a creator also, I mean, you're, you're probably calling people for a reason because you're feeling their energy and you already, you know, you've cultivated your own sound. So, you know, you can... I think that you're probably drawn to certain people because it's probably would be a better fit. So it, it, it does make sense, you know? Yeah, definitely. Like, you know, like-minded people tend to gravitate towards each other. And, yeah. um, and, and I, and I like the thing that genius, you know, is never in silos. It's always groups of people, you know, like mm -hmm. going back to ancient Greece, whatever, you know, you had all the, all the philosophers, you know, getting together and figuring stuff out. And that's what it's right. like for music. And you don't have to go to the ends of, earth, ends of the earth for that. I've worked with some pretty incredible people here in Montreal um, as well um, and, and collaborated with them and, and created things from the ground up. Like most of the production on my second album was was um, done by Montreal producers and, and um, uh, the features were all Montreal, I think all Montreal artists. Um, so wow. I did, I like to go local and abroad, local and abroad, you know, like mm. alternate between albums. A healthy mix. To, to just keep things fresh. Exactly. exactly. It's Kendrick Lamar from Compton and Montreal. They y'all say the average black man only lived to 25. Pac died at 25. How many kids you know dead at 20? Five. Now that's life. I know 10 that's crumbling in coffins. What yeah, year did you approach Kendrick Lamar for a feature on your first record? Um, I think that was in, I think it was in 2011. Right. So, 2011, that's for, it. so what exactly happened with that song? Because you, you approached Top Dog Entertainment for a feature from Kendrick. I guess it was approved mm -hmm. because he did the song. And then yeah. I believe a week later you were asked to remove the song from all streaming or, or a period of time shortly after. Oh you no, were? that was, that was, that was, that was afterwards. So, you know, right. um, we recorded this, uh, the song was done in 2012 and then the album came out in 2015. Right. So, um, and that in the music industry, that's, that's normal. You know, you have a song mm. that circulates for like five years and stuff and you're trying to get deal, deal with label relations and everything mm. like that. And so the song came out in like in, in 2015, the beginning of 2015. Yeah. Okay. And then, so what exactly was the issue with that song from Top Dog once it came out? Oh, I never really, or we never really got any type of uh, explanation for that. Hmm. But um, from what I gather, it didn't really fit into the to the rollout of their marketing for what they were about to do next. So um, we got our signals crossed and um, it just it just went left and uh, just had to let people know that that it was all legit. It was all kosher. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. um, I, I, I made a statement and I went to um, I went to, to court and I, and, I, and I made my case and then 
you know, the judge was like, yeah, I mean, they shouldn't have taken your song down. And, and that's that. And for me now, that's completely, that's completely in the past. It's like the song, the song stands for itself. And what the song was yeah. about from the, from the get go was about police brutality. Um, mm-hmm. And it was about, um, it was about um, coming together. You know what I mean? And those issues are still, you know, hyper relevant today. You know, the song took on a life of its own. And um, actually, you know, since you know, all these terrible things happen, whether it's from Mike Brown to George Floyd, um, it still remains, unfortunately, relevant, you know? Yeah. And as you can tell, you know, with my music, particularly on the lyrical side, um, it's important for me to send the right messages, the positive messages. Mm-hmm messages that help people get through things because that's the origin story for my music and that's and that's where i feel like the music needs to be especially in turbulent times that we're going through right now yeah no i would i would completely agree with that and it, it does sort of strike me as interesting that the song was labeled maybe maybe not accurate for the rollout or you know the best fit but these issues do become more relevant through the years i find and i almost find that song more relevant now maybe than even when it was recorded or released yeah you know it's same it's eerily eerily prophetic um but you know and the reality is is we've been dealing with this for a long time and it's time to yeah. it's time to get past it you know when it's tough it's not easy it's not obvious but you know um struggle continues you know yeah yeah. So you're, you're glad you went through with everything, though, and you, and you sort of stood up for yourself in that situation. Oh, of course. Of course. I mean, like, um, you know, integrity to me is, is pretty important, like not mm-hmm. only just uh, um, integrity in business, but integrity um, of the music itself and interpersonal integrity. And, you know, um, you just got to clear it up, you know, um, mm-hmm. and, and, and this is life, man. Sometimes, you know, things don't go the way you're supposed to do it, but I'm not doing it for that. I'm not doing it only for critical claim or only to flex on people. I'm doing right. it because I think that's what I'm here to do. Yeah. And you, you seem to have a really good sense of your purpose in this. Did that, mm. I'm curious if that took a while to find, or did you from the get go say, I want to do this for, for specific reasons and to, to spread a message? I think it really got, you know, distilled, clarified when I went through what I went through with cancer, mm-hmm. um, but um, a credit to my to my parents um, because they always sort of instilled that in us uh, to be really uh, purpose driven, okay, and to have a lot of integrity, you know. Um, yeah. So for me, you know, it's not it's not like I have all the answers, and not it's not like everything's crystal clear. But at the very minimum, um, I knew what I didn't want to be. You know what mm. I mean. Right. I knew who I, I knew who I didn't want to be, and um, uh, I've, I've stayed steadfast to that. You know, I it, think. that weeds a lot of things <laughs> out, so I, it makes yeah, it a lot easier. Yeah, yeah exactly. You know, um, you don't have to have all the answers. I definitely don't. You know, anyone who says they do, they, they you know, they trip it. But that's a good um, sign that they don't. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I have the answers. Well, I don't know about yeah. you, fam, but, Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the guy who yeah. doesn't say it has them probably. <laughs> <laughs> You, you mentioned your parents. Are your parents Jamaican? Yeah, my mom is Jamaican. My dad is a Black American and French Canadian uh, mixed. Yeah. So, were you born in Jamaica? I was born in Montreal, Montreal, Canada. Um, okay. But ever since the age of I was less than one years old, I've been traveling back uh, back to Jamaica. Um, wow. My mom was born and raised in uh, Westmoreland in a, a town called Savannah Lamar. That's not hmm. not too too far from Negril. Um, okay. And Montego Bay. So it's on that side of the island. Gotcha. See, I've never been to Jamaica, but I, I know a fair amount about it from just knowing people that have. Um, so how did that experience of going back and forth from Canada to Jamaica influence you as a musical creator? It must have influenced you a lot. Yeah, I mean, it, I think it just lives in me. You know, mm-hmm. I only realized how much it impacted me um, um, later on you know, in my teenage right. years and, and, and uh, in the university. But um, it was really always just being able to move through worlds. Um, hmm. Musically, 
Um, my house was always full of music growing up, always full of music. Peter Tosh, Bob Marley, uh, Luciano Pavarotti, uh, uh, Ella Fitzgerald, Nina Simone, uh, The Beatles. Um, wow. You know, it was always full, full of, of music. Um, soul from all ends of the spectrum, so to speak. Like just soulful it, rhythm. It. Yeah. Exactly. You know, my parents are not musicians, right? At all. They're, they're, you know, my mom's background is in psychology, my dad's in law, but um, they realize the importance of, of, of what music does to the soul. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and when I say the soul, it's like you could be doing like the most like gangster progressive rock, like, ah, like, like just wild and <laughs> out. But that, that, there's something about it, man. There's something. Yeah. Man- meditative and there's something empowering and liberating about it and that's why i could i could get down with all types uh, types of music um so being jamaican jamaican and 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 spending so much time there you understand the rhythm right yeah every place has a different rhythm has a different uh, vibrates on a little different frequency i mean like new york is very different from la obvious mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. obvious thing you know detroit is very different from from um from miami so totally. those all those extremes you know it's it's just the culture almost lives in you you know what i mean like so yeah. growing up hearing that music going to jamaica hearing the music it's just like and the language and, and 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 the way people speak, it's it's sort of something that becomes becomes a part of you. So um, that very much informed this latest record that I put out. Um, and I put it out with Bob Marley's label, Tough Gong yeah. uh, International. They're the distributor on that project, and it was like my first like fully reggae album. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm very proud of it because I wanted to pay homage to that part of my identity, to my mother to um all the stories and the eras of, of reggae music yeah so it's something I'm, I'm i'm particularly proud of how did that relationship with tough gong come about did you reach out to them yeah we did um another cold call situation we sent an email wow sent an email to tough gong we got had a generic response to me, like, you know, we don't take unsolicited rare mm. type of thing, right? And we're like, and I, and I told my manager, I'm like, well, you see, I told you, it doesn't really work like that, right? And then an hour or two later, they got a, we got another email being like, hang on, uh, we're going to just listen to this and we're going to get back to you. Oh, <laughs> so, nice. Damn. So we're like, oh, damn. And uh, within a couple of days, they sent the first draft of uh, the distribution agreement. And wow. then we went back and forth for like a month or two and and, and then, and then uh, we signed a deal in August, I think 2019, and and dropped the first single in October 2019. So wow. um, the album was done before we reached out to them. And that right. definitely helps because it gives them, hmm. you know, they can see the vision of what I'm going with the thing. And, and they were like, okay, let's, let's, let's figure out how to work together. Yeah, you're not just coming there sort of with your hand out. You're actually coming there yeah. offering them something. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. a lot of artists, you know, they feel like the album is the end product. Um, and from a creative uh, musical standpoint, okay, yeah. But the album is the beginning of uh, the, the process in terms of the industry or the creative marketing or whatever you're going to do with it. Hmm. It's like, it's like, let's say, you know, you, you, you're a farmer and you're, you know, um, you're, you're you're growing, I don't know, blue agave in Mexico, right? I mean, you're like, this is a beautiful plant, but then it's got to get refined, it's got to get made into tequila, then it's got to go in the truck, then it's got to go to the market, and then someone's mm-hmm. got to buy it and taste it and be like, well, t- you know, that's that's pretty good, right? You know what I mean? So it, it's it's part. That's a tough thing for a lot of artists to realize that when you're finished the album, that is the start. It that's starts start with point. that. It's a, it's a start point. You know, right. and that's why albums take so long to come out, especially mm. when you have all the resources and all the the, connect, the connections in the industry. Is because you know it takes time to create, and it takes time to 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 get to the people. And um, I I think that you know in the world where we just want fast, fast everything, mm. I think the stuff that really stands the test of time is the stuff that you know is, is really thought out and, and and is given time to. To, to, to create, to, to evolve, to, to mature. Yeah. Yeah. 
No, that makes so much sense. And I mean, just thinking of it applied to basically any other scenario, you know, like a master chef, once he finishes that dish, that's just the beginning. Because if the person doesn't enjoy it and they don't receive it the right way or the waiter trips yeah. when they're walking over there, the whole thing's screwed, <laughs> <laughs> you know? So that's that's, it. That, uh, that's it, you know? Yeah. That's fascinating, you know? It's, are there any other misconceptions about the music business that you sort of have have been able to call out and notice? Yeah, it's the, definitely the misconception that everyone knows what they're doing. Um, hmm. These big labels, man, you know, they, they they don't know what they're doing. One department doesn't talk to the other. <laughs> it's like it, you're dealing with these gigantic bureaucracies. I mean, and right. a lot of them have amazing, good people in it, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's it's the conception that they're a monolith and, and the, the left hand knows what the right hand is doing. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's, it's not like that, you know, a bit so, of an illusion. Yeah. So when you get a rejection letter or you don't get a response back or you don't get this, I mean, like you got to think of the music, uh, big labels more like the post office than you do, um, mm. you know, a traditional company, you know, right. uh, there's so many logistics and working parts that you can get lost in the shuffle and it burns a lot of artists out. You know, it really, it really does because you, you ascribe your value to how it's received, but it not goes. So, you know, it's right. It's, it's a different, it's, 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 it's a big machine and you can get lost in it. That makes sense because it's so many different moving parts and it's, it's like a reception vessel to put point A to point B but really the mm-hmm. people in between are, are sort of irrelevant. They're just a point to connect people and to make deals and send out exactly. contracts. Yeah. Exactly. It, so it is like a post office in a weird way. Basic, basically, you know, it's, it's cause I mean, think of it like this. I mean, like you send someone an email, right? Uh, okay. And then they get the email, Oh, they'll say, I'll check it later. And then during that period of time, somebody else takes their position or they get a promotion or they get moved here or they yeah. decide, you know what, I'm, I'm going to go on vacation. And then there's just so many things that get lost in the shuffle. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. um, so for any artist uh, who's um, trying to make it and trying to deal with these big bureaucracies, it's like, I mean, don't let that part of it get you down because that's, yeah. that's you know, nobody controls it almost. Yeah. Hmm. No, that that's a good point, actually. I think it's just whoever decides to seize the day and go do it is the person that's probably going to get it. And the pre- people who just keep knocking at the door, you know yeah. what I mean? Um, but, you know, don't lose sight of the music while you're knocking at the door. Emancipate yourself from mental slavery. None but the wizards can free our mind. Have no fear for atomic energy. Cause none of them can stop us the time. How long shall they kill our brothers? You know, speaking back to some of your Jamaican sort of roots and your upbringing, um, I'm curious, what's your your perception on the sort of uh the legacy of bob marley in relation to jamaica like the amount Mm -hmm. of i think there's even you know certain segments of people that go for tourism there for bob marley and such how i know you can't speak for all jamaicans but for yourself and sort of your family how do you guys feel about that is that sort of like how canadians feel about ice hockey you know what i mean or is it good (laughs) (laughs) no i i think i think it's i think it's good you know Mm -hmm. um I think it's it's phenomenal. It's great because for any type of culture or country, what you want is um, you want a, a global ambassador. You know, uh, you want for any church, every church needs a saint. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, um, and he um, he was the you know the the guiding force and the introduction point for so many people to reggae music. Yes. And from that, you know, sort of selfish way, that's that's really important. But he was also an insanely productive, um, profound um, writer and creator. Yeah. Um, And. And to not acknowledge that would, you know, it's, it's like, you know, you have a hero and to not acknowledge that or not to fully embrace that would be a little crazy, I think, you know? Yeah. I mean, why um, not? Why not acknowledge it? You know, celebrate your heroes while they're alive. 
you know, um, because they won't li live forever. And it's and it's sad, but it's so um, amazing to see how even after he died, I mean, he died, um, you know, like four, four, um, like, I don't know, years before I was born. Mm -hmm. right? But the impact he had, he's had on my life and the legacy of his music and the way that he changed the perception of Jamaica and, and the global perception of things, I think is very important. I think it's very important. Yeah. Yeah. And it's crazy to see how long his legacy has lasted on. You know, it's uh, generation after generation. They know Bob Marley and they probably will continue to, you know. Do you feel yeah. like he's he's um, one of the greatest reggae artists or is he the greatest reggae artist? I think um, all things considered, he is the great and greatest reggae artist. I think he mm -hmm. I think he is. But because if you want to look at if you take all the metrics of what you consider great Right. Right. And then you go down. You add it all up. One. There's very <laughs> few areas in which you could say he's not the greatest of that. And so, you know, that's what it is. Um, you know, it's, I feel this. I feel very much the same way about Jimi Hendrix. Right. Mm -hmm. I feel very much the same way about John Lennon. Um, you know, I feel very much the same way about, you know, uh, Nina Simone in terms of her soul, her soul music. Yes. Um, that. I don't think we should, should be a shy, a shy to appreciate the greatness and build on it, you know, um, especially if it opens people up, like I said before, especially if it opens people up to being like, okay, who else is great? And then you discover Toots and then you discover Pita Tosh and then you just discover Lady Star and then you discover Beanie Man and then you discover Buju Bantan. And, it, you know, so um, if your 101 is Bob Marley, that's a strong 101 right there. Well, it is. I mean, <laughs> and it's hard to debate, too, because, I mean, you know, hit for hit, pound for pound, number for number. Mm -hmm. he, he really has it all. And, and here on Watch Mojo, they did a list of the top reggae artists. Bob Marley was number one. Mm -hmm. um, number five was Steel Pulse. Number four, Damian Marley. Mm -hmm. Number three, Alba Rose. Alba Rose, sorry, that's a new name to me. And number two, Gentleman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I mean, this is a list. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I like Peter I Tosh mean, and Buju myself, you know, <laughs> but you know, I mean, it's a list, but you know, like, it, it's just a funny quirk of like the way our society is built, like the top five, this and right, right. like, if, if I were to ask you like the top five, I don't know, the, the, the top five emotional experiences in your life. I mean, I'm sure you could list me the top five emotional experiences, but that's not what makes you as a person, you know, like right. art, art, art is, art is not as competitive as the music industry would like us to be, to think it is, right? Mm -hmm. So there's so much value and there's such a wide range of, of things you can do. Like, I don't even know if it really would make sense to, to you know, uh, to, to, to rank music like that. But in terms of um, Watch Mojo's model, yeah, yeah, I could feel, I could feel like, I, I could understand why they would do <laughs> <laughs> No, I hear you. No, and I mean, it, it, it is fascinating. And that's why I love bringing up these lists because everybody has a different perspective and sometimes yeah. people agree or they're shocked. Um, yeah. I love that. Everyone, yeah, especially in hip hop, it's like top five. Dead or alive. You know, it's like, you know, they're, they're, it's like so qualitatively different. It's like, what do you like better, pasta? or lemons it's like what, what's right like, what do you mean like, like it's like it's not in the you know what i mean so yeah it's even within the same genre of music that you know the difference between buju and and uh, i don't know and jimmy cliff is like it's, it's worlds it's huge. apart it's, it's huge so you know yeah. um but in terms of popularity and pop culture and, and getting people to get to that one-on-one -on -one point where they want to learn more Mm -hmm. I love it. I love these types of things. I just, I just smile and be like, all right, that's, that's a, that's a list. That's a list. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I hear that for sure. <laughs> so in, in terms of uh, just to wrap it up, you've done a lot of sort of community work and speaking for mm -hmm. various things. You've been involved in black history month. You've been involved in things about your, your journey. Talk to me about some of the giving back and community work that you've done. Well, um, I, that is uh, always, a. Uh, um, part of my life like just um just recently uh right before christmas uh, we i did a live stream um for um uh, the universal negro improvement uh, association here in montreal which is a organization that has, that's been around for over 100 years wow. um and uh i feel that um so much has been you know given to me like you know 
you know, we live in a world where there's all sorts of types over oh, what is privilege and blah, blah, blah. Like I can recognize, you know, in a certain sense that I'm very fortunate. I'm very privileged in certain ways. And um, I should be able to, 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 to lift up, to repay my community for their support, but at the same time to um, encourage people to do the same. So mm-hmm. um, I've done Black History Month tours. I've also done and spoke about cancer and my experience with cancer and music um i've also worked for different non-profit organizations uh, here in montreal and in the united states um gone down to schools in the u.s and baltimore and given 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 presentations um sharing a little bit of the same messages so i mean that that is a, a part of a defining characteristic and that's part of like you know how i was raised part of my community but also mm-hmm. a part of the idea of reggae music you know it's all one mm-hmm. love it's all um collective movements and it's all collective respect you know so yeah i try to you know it's just a, it's just a mode that you exist in and the more you're in it you know the more i feel it's fruitful to my spirit and you know, it's beneficial to others. You know, some people I haven't seen in 10 years. I'm like, I remember you when you said this in my class, you came to my grade seven class, you gave a presentation, you did this. Mm. And that for me, that for me, that's impactful, you know, um, yeah, that, you know, I can make someone think and sort of reciprocate and not to be too, too cheesy or too cornballish, but, you know, each one teach one, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, it's not just me. I've learned from so many people. It's just paying it forward still. Yeah, no, it's true. Things only become cliche most of the time because they're accurate and, you know, (laughs) or mostly accurate, you know, so I I would agree with that. Well, man, Jonathan, it's been incredible speaking with you and uh, yeah, just really, really great insight. Is there anything else that you wanted to add or that that you got coming up that's exciting? Yeah, man, next time you've got to put me on your top reggae artist list because, you know, I'm going to take issue. Yeah, we'll put that number one on the remastered (laughs) list. (laughs) And um, But yeah, I would encourage everybody to just go check out JonathanEmil.com. That's J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N-E-M-I-L-E.com. And um, link up with me. Follow me on Spotify, Apple Music, all them type of things. And uh, keep liking and subscribing. Cassius Maris, fun thing. Respect. One love. Hey, respect. Thank you. 